Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 694 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 21st of May 2023 as I record this from Auckland, New Zealand. So in today's show I'm talking with Tony Park about writing novels inspired by place and also our interests since Tony weaves his love of Africa and also conservation into his thrillers without lecturing which is the best way to tell a story with heart. He also talks about how things have changed in his 20 years of publishing experience, how he got some of his rights back, and the importance of speaking to real people in real places as part of your book research. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news, well, the big news this week is KDP sent an email saying that KDP printing costs are changing from 20th of June 2023. So take action and put your print prices up. So this is actually good to do periodically anyway, but since the costs are going up, we need to review our prices. As their email says, an increase in the fixed cost for all paperback and hardcover books Uh, So basically, these are the changes. An increase in the fixed cost for paperback and hardcover books to cover the higher cost of materials, suppliers and labour. A new fixed and per page cost for paperback and hardcover books with large trim sizes, which is larger than 6.12 inches or 9 inches in height. And that covers a lot of us, including myself, who do large print books. And also there is a decrease in per page cost for certain colour ink print books, but generally the prices will be going up. So these changes affect your royalties for paperback and hardcover books. While not required, you may choose to update your list prices to avoid a change in royalty payments or zero royalties on paperback and hardcover books where your list price drops below the new minimum list price. So basically the costs are going up we need to put our prices up. And this is true across the entire publishing industry, to be honest. Uh, You should also review your prices on Ingram and uh, if you use any of the other stores as well. Now, KDP does have a bulk update option where you can just do it once or you can update each book individually. So I'm definitely taking this as a chance to go in and review the backlist. But for sure, do it before the 20th of June, 2023. And there is a help topic on KDP which I will link to in the show notes. So then in personal news, which I'll also round up with uh, AI stuff today, because I'm in Auckland, New Zealand, Aotearoa, as I mentioned. And uh, if you are new to the show, I used to live here. I lived here for almost six years. Uh, I'm a New Zealand citizen. My husband is a Kiwi and uh, we are visiting my mother-in-law and family uh, over here. So it's not really a holiday, (laughs) as you will understand if you travel long distance for family. And the jet lag is truly killer and obviously my sound is not its usual quality because I don't have all my gear with me. The weather is being classic Auckland autumn, (laughs) lots of rain and I'm sure you know the song Four Seasons in One Day, that's absolutely what it is but we're making the most of being here. Now I attended a couple of events this week at the Auckland Writers Festival on AI. Now it's very interesting, I mean New Zealand's not a big country um, but so I, I wasn't expecting so many people but the Writers Festival was absolutely absolutely packed and the AI sessions were packed which I was also very interested in. Now the demographic of writers festivals in general is a lot of older people and uh, so that was reflected in the audience but one session must have had over a thousand people in. I mean seriously it was in the main hall of a a theatre and it was Seriously, I I was just not expecting to see so many people in a session on AI, but that just shows you how much ChatGPT in particular has become part of the zeitgeist and the discussions in every area. Now, the AI sessions were as expected (laughs) in terms of content in that they were 
pretty negative and uh, difficult. Although I appreciated uh, one of the speakers, Teitaka Keegan, who is the Associate Professor at the University of Waikato, a computer science researcher and an advocate for the use of Te Reo Māori, which is the Māori language. And he was wary of AI, but also encouraged usage, saying that if you stay away from the AI tools, they will develop without you. And it's better to be involved He said, be aware, not scared, and shape it by being part of it, which of course I agree with. Toby Walsh, author of Machines Behaving Badly and also professor of AI at Sir Sydney University, talked about AI as an alien intelligence and not to think of it as human. Uh, And also that there are many potential issues ahead, but machines that amplify the human mind could solve the greatest problems of humanity. So there there was a mixture of sort of, um, yes, there are challenges, but and the new industrial revolution was also mentioned several times in that we're moving into a a huge change in in history and being part of it is is important. Now, what annoyed me the most and what has actually galvanised me into action was the reading of a passage generated by GPT-3 by a literary author. So essentially she read her own passage and then she read a passage with the same prompt, uh, well, that she used a a quote uh, as a prompt. She compared the writing to her own and read the two passages and asked the audience to judge. (laughs) Now, it was obvious what was the human writing and what was the AI. But I was annoyed, not because I disagree with that. I mean, I think that's fine. But basically, her prompt was terrible. So she handicapped the machine by not using it properly. Uh, Her prompt was appalling. And she was also using the old version and not the latest GPT-4. So in my opinion, if you can't get some kind of decent writing from the machine, it's because you, the user, are not doing a good job of using it. And then in another session, the chair used GPT-3 live to generate an introduction to the session and then criticised it for being factually wrong. And again, if you've done basic research on this, you would know that the free version of ChatGPT is not connected to the internet. And if you want uh, GPT-4 connected to the internet, you can use Bing Chat. So just go to, um, yes, Microsoft Bing, and it, you can use it on the internet, or you can now use gpt plus with browsing. So um, I've this week I got access to the plugins and also uh, browsing. So you can now use it with access to the internet. Uh, There is also an app now available in the USA soon to be rolled out globally. So I guess I was annoyed that the panels had not done their homework and weren't up to date. But uh, so they they weren't talking about where things are right now. And given that things change every week, it's important to share the latest updates. And if you're doing a talk, then really give try. If you want to prove that human writing is better than AI writing, give the AI a chance. <laughs> so yes, the, the discussion of it's either AI writing or either human writing, so either or, that also annoys me, as you probably know by now. Uh, Things are not entirely AI or entirely human. That is not the reality of where we are. Essentially, now we need to break everything into roles, not jobs. So when people say, oh, it's going to replace the job of a being an author. No, it's not. (laughs) But we can separate everything we do into roles. So I was going to encourage you today to make a list of everything that goes into the job of being an author or whatever job you do. So uh, Jonathan, my husband, is doing this for his job. And then consider what you could use AI tools for and what is entirely human. So that's how most jobs are going to go. For example, you might use ChatGPT for coming up with lists of names for characters or ideas for plot points or keyword topics for nonfiction or rewriting your sales descriptions or writing your Facebook ads. Um, But it's not 100% of your job in the same way that Jonathan is, um, well, he's he's a manager of programmers, but the job of a programmer these days, the generation of code can be done with AI, but actually figuring out what the client actually needs (laughs) uh, is, you know, still can't be done by the AI. So consider roles, not jobs, when you're thinking about this. So anyway, rather than stay annoyed, uh, it, this has galvanised me into action. Now, many of you have been asking me to share what I'm doing behind the scenes. So if I say, well, I don't think that lady was prompting very well, well, I should share my prompts. So I have been 
quite deep in all this stuff and I'm pretty comfortable with my processes. So I have decided I will start doing some webinars and uh, on how to use the various AI tools. I'll only be doing small group sessions and they will be live only, uh, although if you book a ticket, you'll get the recording, but I will not be selling the recordings as essentially this stuff changes every week. So I'm not willing to essentially sell things that are out of date. I will change the material every time based on the new information and new ways of using things. So I am doing the first sessions over the weekend of the 24th and 25th of June, 2023. You can go to to thecreativepen.com forward slash live, L-I-V-E. So thecreativepen.com forward slash live or links in the show notes. And I've got um, a session, two sessions that will cover various time zones, including New Zealand and Australia and the US and the UK. Um, and uh, that one, so it's one on my Sunday morning UK time will be uh, appropriate for UK, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, And there's one on a Saturday afternoon that will be appropriate for the UK, but also the US. So uh, I will record those sessions, as I said, and send them to ticket holders if you can't attend live, but the recordings won't be sold. I will be covering attitude to AI, ethical usage, copyright, legalities, what it can and can't do, how to prompt ChatGPT in the most effective way and designing your mega prompts, because this is the way forward right now. ChatGPT for fiction, brainstorming, world building, character ideation, outlining, discovery, writing, book titles. ChatGPT for nonfiction, outlining, topics, writing, book titles and more. Pseudo write for aspects of fiction. ChatGPT for editing plus pro writing aid, how that's changing. ChatGPT for book marketing, sales descriptions, social media. Mid journey for social media images, character portraits and aspects of book cover and stock photo designs. And what's coming next in AI, and I will be mentioning auto GPT, text to video and more. And hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A, but uh, there's lots to go through. Uh, it's going to be a two hour session. And I did send the link out to my patrons first. So uh, tickets are, <laughs> depending on the demand, uh, I will add some more dates potentially uh, if they sell out. So we shall see. You can get tickets at thecreativepen.com forward slash live. And the tickets are £75. So if you're interested, come on over to thecreativepen.com forward slash live. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments. Uh, I'm really happy with the volume of AI positive comments now, uh, which really help uh, offset the negative <laughs> ones which are also increasingly vitriolic so it's awesome it makes a huge difference to my ability to keep reporting on this stuff and I'm encouraged that it is helping you figure out your attitudes Christine said on the Stephen Marsh AI interview this was great fear spiral unspiraled (laughs) thank you both thanks Christine and Julie, who I met for coffee this week in Auckland, said on the interview with Toby Neal, I couldn't love this interview more. Great tools and tips for anyone, not just authors. I especially loved the tapping suggestion, the garbage versus luggage idea and the use of stickers, whatever it takes to keep up the self-care. So remember, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author-first approach is one of the reasons they developed a promotions tool. This is an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers. They offer lots of promotions that don't require you to drop your price, because they know when you're publishing wide, it can be a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. Any promotions listed as a percent off, for example, a 40% VIP sale, mean you don't have to change your price, as the discount will be provided by promo code at checkout. If that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percent off promotions and buy more save more sales, where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to Kobo. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers all about it. 
The promotions tool is updated on a weekly basis, so make sure you're taking a regular look to see what's on offer and if there's an opportunity that best matches your books and marketing plans. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll enable this for you. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and find them on social media. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. And just on a personal note, the Kobo Promotions tab, uh, I basically go in there every couple of weeks and apply for a whole load of promotions. A lot of them I don't get, but the ones I do get really help sell books on Kobo. So if you are on Kobo and you go direct, you should definitely get the Promotions tab. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you to everyone who's been supporting the show for years and months. You are fantastic. And thank you to new and returning patrons this week. TB Markinson, Laura Goldbaum, Walsh, Jody and Karen Bella, Cheryl Rogers, Bart Hopkins, James Weaver and Dale Marfood. So if you support the show on Patreon, you get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only, which is around 45 minutes of audio where I answer all the questions about writing craft, publishing, book marketing and making a living with your writing, plus AI questions, which are coming up more and more. I also share discount codes, early access to things like my AI webinars and more. You can support the show with just a few dollars, euros, pounds, Canadian dollars, whatever, (laughs) and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio. Support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Tony Park is the author of 20 thriller novels set in Africa, as well as the co-writer of several biographies. So welcome, Tony. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm a huge fan. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you so much. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Yeah, look, it might sound a bit cliche, but it's absolutely true that the only thing I ever wanted to do in life from the time I was a little boy growing up in Sydney in Australia was to write a book. And my family weren't particularly well off. And my mum used to, she was working two jobs and used to leave us in the library after school. And I just thought, wouldn't it be cool if this could be your job to write books? And of course, as we all know, listening to this podcast, it's not like you can say, wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to write a book and publish it. And away we go. But I, I loved writing as a kid. I wasn't any good at English or maths at school. And so I pinned my hopes on writing. And after I left school, I got a job working in local newspapers and that cemented my love of of writing. And then I just tried and tried and tried. Had a number of false starts over the years as my life progressed. I'd wake up early in the morning before work and try and start a novel and I'd try after work and I couldn't really focus. And this went on for years and years, too long. I think I waited too long to get serious about it and got got married and got a mortgage and real life intruded and everything. And the one of the the two biggest challenges I faced were time, right? That everybody faces, you know, but a place was was what eluded me. And I know we're going to talk about that a bit later on, but I all I knew was I wanted to write a novel. I hadn't even really thought long enough to think where I was going to set it or when I was going to uh, set it. And when I was about 32, 33, I went to my wife and I said, I've got an idea. How about I leave work and you support us for six months and I'll try and write a book? (laughs) Nice one. (laughs) (laughs) And to my utter astonishment, she said, yes, go for it. Because I think she was sick of me, you know, going on about how much I wanted to write. And so I did. I left work and I wrote a book. I I bought a couple of books about how to write books. And I, I wrote this book like textbook style, like I plotted it meticulously. I had character profiles and a timeline, a chapter breakdown and everything. And when... And, and I, the place I picked for it was wrong because I made a fundamental error is I was writing a book that I think I wanted other people to read rather than something I was passionate about. So I set it in the Australian outback and there was one tiny problem. I'd never actually been to the outback. <laughs> so Even though you're Australian. Even though I'm Australian, I'm a city boy, you know, living in the suburbs. And I took my six months, I wrote a book and I failed spectacularly because I didn't enjoy the process 
of, of plotting. I didn't know that you could not plot, that you could just make it up as you went along because I had no formal training. And I found it very mechanical and very boring. And around about that time, my wife and I went on a holiday to Africa, which was supposed to be a once in a lifetime trip. But instead, we got hooked on Africa and went back the following year, and back the following year. And on my third trip to Africa, we had a long trip, about four months around Southern Africa. And I had another go at writing a book because I once more had time. I'd had to go back to work, but I once more had time. And here I was in a place that I had kind of started to get to know and was amazing and inspirational and fascinating. And there was so much going on here that I thought I could write a book set in Africa. And instead of plotting it, I'll just make it up as I go along. So it was set on a fictitious tour around Africa as my wife and I were traveling around Southern Africa. And each day as we moved camp, I just wrote another few pages and made it up as we went along and just copied the landscapes that we were in into the text. And I sent it to a publisher and the first publisher I sent it to, Pam McMillan in Australia, published it. And my publisher said, you can write the books in Africa. And here I am 20 years later writing the books in Africa. I love that. I love the story. There's so much to learn from that. So 20 years later, and we're going to come back to the Africa and the setting thing, but you said Mm. 20 years later, you're still writing and publishing, but of course, things have changed in 20 years. And one of the things I picked up from your website is that you also run Ingui Publishing. So Mm. tell us how your publishing experience has also changed over the last two decades, because things have really changed and you have too, obviously. And it's massive, the amount of change. And yeah, my life has changed. It's moved on. Technology has changed. Everything has has moved on. And I think like, you know, when we talk about those days, it seems like a long time ago, is that people would pin their hopes on getting a commercial publishing deal. And, and I did. And, and I was absolutely thrilled and over the moon when I got it. Funny little side story. I'm, I was in the Army Reserve, Australian Army Reserve for 34 years. And I was actually in Afghanistan. I was deployed there in 2002 when I got the email from my publisher saying, hey, good news, open this email. We're going to give you a publishing contract. And (laughs) I I couldn't even have a beer to celebrate because we were on the drive over there. So I I was really thrilled to get a publishing uh, deal. And I thought that was the be all and end all. And over the years, I had some limited success or it started to grow. My primary market was my home market in Australia, even though there were These books are all set in Africa. It is a thing. It's almost like a genre of its own, African fiction. And I had some success getting commercial publishing deals in the UK and later in the the US. But the books didn't do particularly well. And that was was like I'd gone from this high to thinking, oh, no, why aren't I selling many books there? And and that that really started to affect me quite badly. But then things changed dramatically, you know, over the last few years. And I learned so much, not least of all from your podcast and hearing from other authors who are independently publishing. Because, of course, when 20 years ago when I was first publishing, there was quite a bit of stigma attached to self-publishing. And, you know, it was called vanity publishing because you had to be very vain and you had to be very rich to do it. You'd have to print thousands of copies of books and then pay a distributor to try and get them in the in the shop so it was this hugely involved expensive process but i have found in more recent years that what made more sense for me was to kind of do a a a civil sort of deal with my uk publishers and the distributors and say look guys this it's not really working for both of us because it wasn't i was losing so much because i had an agent at the time i was losing so much on all of the in-between cuts that come out of a royalty that it wasn't wasn't worth it i was down to about 30 pence per book i think i was making you know Mm. um and so i set up ingui publishing ingui means leopard uh and took back my rights and was then able to start exploring print on demand and ebook self-publishing or indie publishing and i found that for my sales in the uk and us which i'm very proud of but you know i'm not selling hundreds of thousands or millions of books i make a really really good second income out of it and i think having your own imprint and taking control of those matters, not just from a business side of things, but from a personal side of things, has been really rewarding and fulfilling, far more so than chasing those kind of overseas publishing deals and trying to define yourself by those sorts of deals, which quite often aren't really in your interest as an author. Mm. So you're now, I guess, what we now call a hybrid author and that you still mm. license to traditional publishing in Australia? 
And South Africa. Australia, New Zealand and South Africa are my commercial markets, my traditional markets, yeah. Mm, Okay. No, that's really interesting. And so just for people listening, that's English language that you have split into territories. So you're not signing contracts for world English. You're splitting the territories. Absolutely. And I I made so many mistakes when I I started out. Like I was so pathetically grateful to my publishers and I still am, you know, to pay McMillan. But I had to look at this now as a business because I, I I wouldn't say I didn't read my contracts. I didn't really understand them that well, maybe. But yeah, I was willy-nilly signing over English language rights worldwide. And I then had to go back to my publisher and say, look, hey, I'm going to start doing my own thing. So I need you to please give me back all those worldwide rights. Uh, The same thing went for audio. You know, I've been really interested to hear you talk about changes in the audio book world. I I have a good relationship with an audio book publisher with Belinda in Australia and and I I now keep my audio rights to myself and I do with them what I want to and I think too many authors that chase that commercial publishing deal are so grateful that they think I'll I'll do whatever you want to you know I will will, will give you anything that you possibly ask for Uh, and of course that doesn't make sense so yeah I'm a hybrid I guess is is the best way to talk about it and I, I really enjoy doing my own thing and of course it is such a an amazing, constantly changing environment that we live and work in. Uh, it puts a lot of onus on authors to stay on top of that, but I enjoy it. I enjoy kind of the buzz of the business side of it. Mm, I think that's a good tip as well. I mean, you do have to enjoy the business side, but I think you can learn how to enjoy it. I mean, like you said, you haven't, you didn't start out that way. You just learned it over time and that's important. But just, just a question on the process of getting your rights back. So there'll be people listening who have signed those mm. contracts maybe a while back or even more recently. And now they're like, oh dear, I shouldn't have signed that. So j- just give us a few tips on the process of getting rights back. Yeah, well, I think if you have a good relationship with your publisher, that certainly helps. And I was lucky. I was always had a, a good, friendly relationship. I never at any stage got the feeling that they were ever trying to rip me off or pull one over me or anything like that. But it was more a matter of saying to them, look, I signed over all my English language rights. You had a go at getting me some foreign translation deals or foreign publishing deals, maybe a, a UK deal because I was based in Australia and it didn't work. I would like to take those back. And I didn't have any resistance for that. Certainly when there's no money involved, there's no <laughs> resistance mm-hmm. because in, in the case of one of my earlier books, uh, my Pam McMillan Australia got me a publishing deal with Pam McMillan UK. That book was in print for a year or two. Didn't do particularly well. They didn't want any more of the books. So then when I said, can I have all my English language rights back, they didn't really have a leg to stand on because they had tried to get me some, you know, a US a UK deal. It didn't work. And so I had to do it in writing. It's quite an involved process. I've got to do it in writing. And then the rights people within the publishing house have to do a separate an amendment and send that back to you to sign. Uh, where there's money involved, I'm also looking at taking back some rights from the UK from a publisher that still distributes into South Africa, which is one of the deals I did in the past. And if I want those rights back for South Africa, I will have to pay for those. They will calculate that based on my annual sales and any advances that are still outstanding. But in my personal experience, if there's not really any money or serious money involved in it, publishers are very reasonable on this kind of thing. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it, that paying for things. I actually recently paid out an audiobook narrator in order to get the rights back for an audiobook. And mm. I mean, it, it's funny because when we sign these things originally, we have a certain thing in mind. And then years later, we're like, OK, then I, I, I've changed <laughs> my mind and that's fine. And so it's good to know and people listening, you can go back and renegotiate contracts. That That's part of it. And as you say, trying to be less emotional is probably... <laughs> probably the best idea like yeah. who's, whose and, business interest is it in and try and think about it from the publisher's perspective as well and try and come exactly. to a business arrangement not an emotional thing it, it's good to know uh, or at least be interested enough to read about copyright and how these contracts work and it's kind of fun when, once you get into it it's really interesting but let's return to Africa so hopefully people can hear from your accent that you are Australian, obviously you mentioned before, but your books are set in Africa and you live between Sydney Ooh. and South Africa. So tell us Ooh. a bit more about, I guess, the books and how you weave in your fascination with Africa and how you write setting, I guess, when you're not from this country. From You said it in South Africa, obviously Africa is not a country, South Africa <laughs> being the country. Yeah. So how do you yeah, get, sure. yeah, so what are your tips for writing these settings and why Africa? 
Yeah, well, why Africa, I think, is just that's, uh, if I, I don't have a niche, but I think why Africa, because there's that great adage that says, write about what you know, but I think write about what you're interested in. And this is a continent that continues to fascinate me, you know, 20, more than 20 years since I first visited here, because it's always changing. As you say, it's so many different cultures, so many different countries. The countries that I write about within broadly Southern Africa have also changed dramatically in some cases over the last 25, 26 years or so. So there's plenty of inspiration there, which is important. I'm passionate about things like the continent's wildlife and also social issues that are going on in some of the countries that I write about and the politics. So that's my hook, I guess, and that's what I'm interested in. When it comes to setting, it's crucial because a lot of the people who buy my books, I'm sure, just buy them because they're set in Africa. I know so many of my readers who will just read every Wilbur Smith book or they'll read uh, every Ryder Haggard book or they'll read every, everything that they can possibly find set in Africa. Perhaps they've lived there. Perhaps they're an expat who's moved to the UK or moved to Australia and part of them misses their home country. So there's there's an interest in setting. Setting becomes like a hook for someone to buy a book. So it's very important. I, mean, I, I have come up with a few tips. I did a presentation on it recently. The first thing I'd say about setting that I've learned is you have to make it work for you. You have to give it a job. It's not just window dressing. It's not just describing a, a lovely location or just to anchor a character in a scene. But it, a setting it can show us how a character is, is thinking or what they're feeling. And that'll be coloured and enhanced by the environment around them and, and how they view it. You know, like so if a character is up or happy they'll revel in the rich beauty of the savannah landscape the wildlife and they'll be uh, fascinated by the heritage and the people but if they're down or facing adversity or in danger then you weave in things like the leaded skies the dirty streetscapes the tatty old buildings or that lion lurking in the long grass with the chilling golden eyes as a portent of doom so you you give your descriptions of location and setting a, a job i think first and something that I've learned over the years. And then uh, setting and place, they're, they're more than just the physical description of the landscape. I think people can fall into that trap of waxing lyrical about what the area looks like. But of course, it it takes in things like the history of a place, the, the politics and culture which go to the mood of a particular place or setting. It's the people in the street, the music that's playing, the public art or graffiti, the food on the streets, or the absence of food, what people are drinking. And when it comes to people, the, the different cultures, fashions, languages and backgrounds of people are, are crucial in the sort of books I write. Quite often, these are sources of, of conflict as well as uh, kind of celebration and enrichment in the countries that I, I live in. Quite quite often, things like culture and politics are, are life and death matters in, in the background of, of where I write my books. And then, of course, there's the natural world, my books, the wildlife, the birds, the reptiles, the environment, and and the state of the environment, the problems with the natural landscape, which certainly are things that I touch on with things like poaching and environmental issues, and climate comes into it. So the the third thing I would say to people is when you're writing place, use all of the key elements of writing, not, not just description. Also use narrative and dialogue because the narrative, you can weave in a little bit of the history and the impressions of the streetscape and the country from your character's point of view certainly use the description this is your excuse to to exercise your skill and your flair in describing a scene painting a picture that's good but also use dialogue i always say to people a simple example is rather than say it's hot or come up with some metaphor for how hot it is just have a character say i'm melting you know <laughs> so work in a bit of dialogue into the setting and and if I can just continue, the fourth one I would say, I always love to tell people, show, don't tell. I don't have any tattoos, Joanna, but I always tell people when I'm giving writing courses or instruction that if I had, if I was going to have tattoos, I would write show, don't tell on one hand, and I would write trust the process on my other hand to sort of keep <laughs> me motivated each day. But I think show, don't tell, it's a good thing to keep harping on about it and to keep uh, bringing back. So when it comes to uh, uh, describing a setting in show us let us feel us drop us in the middle of the bush or the marketplace engage the senses at least a couple of them at a time i mean let's have your character smell the street food 
cooking or or the musty, dirty laundry smell of an elephant, because that's what an elephant smells like, like if you've left your washing too long in the hamper and it's all damp. So <laughs> get that sort of thing in there. And there's some good advice that I picked up um, from Stephen King's book on writing is to to which is, I guess, if I could say my Bible, I don't offend anyone by saying that, but it's my go-to book is Stephen King's On Writing. And he talks about zooming in on the little things. Don't just say the birds were singing, but give us the name of the bird and what its call is, or show us that child's doll in the rubble of the burned-out building. In some of my books, I pick up the most amazing things as I travel and research. I put in one book, Safari, that's set in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I had a character drinking... Guinness and Coca-Cola, which is a particularly popular drink in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And a few people <laughs> messaged me after that saying, do people really drink Guinness mixed with Coca-Cola? And they do. And as Stephen King says, a few well-chosen details will stand for the rest. And the final thing I want to say about places, something I've also learned sometimes the hard way, is you've got to get it right. This is our job. You know, we, it, we, we have entered into a kind of contract with the reader where if they want to be taken to another place, they expect it to be done accurately and faithfully, particularly if they've lived there themselves. And if you're lucky enough to, say, go and visit a place that you want to set your novel in, to travel as part of your job as a writer, that's great. But you have to make sure that if you've got characters that are living in that area, that that the places and the experiences are relevant to them. Just a very quick example of that. I read a crime novel not too long ago by a very big name, world-renowned crime writer who had obviously been to Sydney, to my hometown, and had obviously had a very good time there because this author had a character, an Australian character who was a policeman, a detective sergeant. He lived in a place called Brighton, which is actually called Brighton La Sands. It's not called Brighton, so that was a mistake. He kind of abbreviated it. But this detective sergeant's couldn't meet the lead character because he was taking his son sailing that afternoon at a place called Rushcutters Bay. Now, Rushcutters Bay and Brighton are at two opposite ends of the city, and Brighton is on Botany Bay. It's a very good place to go sailing. So why this detective sergeant would be taking his son to Rushcutters Bay sailing in the afternoon didn't make any sense. I've yet to come across a cop that owns a yacht in Sydney. <laughs> And uh, Maybe I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> I may be, and, and and I've yet to come across one who probably wasn't crooked that would be able to afford membership of the Rushcutters Bay Sailing Club. So there were all these like jarring references. The descriptions were probably spot on, but it, it's about context, right? It's about getting things right, and it's about context. And mm. and I would say to people, as I do whenever I'm talking about research, the same thing goes to place: is visit these places. Read about them, learn about them. But the best way to research or to to capture place accurately, particularly if you're not from there, and this is a situation I have found myself over the years, is talk to a local. Spend your time finding a local online if you have to and just ask them a few questions about their hometown and what it's like. So sorry, mm. that was quite long, but that's my five basic um, basic tips about No, sitting. no, good, t- good tips there. But you know, I'm going to have to challenge you. <laughs> and sure, we, we, uh, we, we, Yeah, we have to talk about the elephant on the podcast, which is <laughs> at the end of the day, you're an Australian and you're writing about Africa. You're also a white guy. And obviously there's a lot of white Africans, but there are also a lot of other people <laughs> in Africa. And one of the things yep. in this current writing climate is a perspective on writing authenticity based on your own background. Now, Mm. um, I'm, and also like you mentioned before, African fiction being a genre, and you mentioned Wilbur Smith, who, again, someone from the outside. So how are you addressing this? How has it come up for you? How are you addressing it? And what are your recommendations for people? Yeah, it sure has. And it's a really, really good question. It's very topical. Very relevant as well, too. Also, it can be a tricky one because people will say, you know, you can't appropriate a particular culture or a particular race or something like that to write about if you're not from there. And yet on the same hand, I don't want to be criticised for only having like old white guys in my books because that's not reflective of my readership over here in South Africa anymore. The interesting thing is there's two strands to it. Publishers are certainly becoming more aware of it. So my South African publishers, Pam McMillan South Africa especially, will do a sensitivity read these days. And they're looking at sort of uh, cultural aspects, uh, any issues to do with race or background and those sort of things, which is good. The other thing that that I've found is like from a personal point of view, 
my books have changed over the years in line with my experience. So my earlier novels tended to be about outsiders who found themselves in Africa, tourists or people visiting for work or something who then got themselves in a bit of trouble because the books are all thrillers or got tangled up with poachers or something like that. Because that was my experience. I was learning at the time. As time has gone on, and I, I live here now, you know, like now at the moment, most of the year, my circle of friends has grown. My readership has changed because the, South Africa has really got a really good vibe about it at the moment. Publishing is doing well and, and changing as socioeconomic standards and demographics and things change here in South Africa. So there is a growing affluent middle to upper class, I guess you would say here, of African people that has kind of emerged over the last 22, 20 years or so with more leisure time, more time to spend going visiting national parks, more interest in reading fiction. There, there's quite a boom here in, in African women's fiction here at the moment, which is fantastic to see. And what I'm finding is my readers here in South Africa are from the various African cultures, from the Indian culture, from the English-speaking South African culture, from the Afrikaans-speaking South African country culture, and they're my friends. And so I feel like a need. I have to tap into those cultures and reflect them in my writing. So I go out of my way to do my own sensitivity checks. You know, it's a really important thing you say, and it's not to be glossed over because when I have seen, I do a bit of mentoring, and, and if I've seen other people talking about some of the cultures, I want to ask them, have you actually checked a lot of this stuff? And it's not good enough. It's not good enough to go online and say, I'm going to have somebody speaking a few words in an African language. This is a mistake I made. I've made a lot of mis- Well, this was a mistake that was caught before publishing, but I had a book set in Zimbabwe called African Dawn, which is a bit of a sweeping saga over 50 years of Zimbabwe's tumultuous history and all the politics and conflict that have gone on in that country. And I'm lucky I've got quite a few Zimbabwean readers. And I got a, a lady called Taku Mbudzi, uh, who was living in Australia, to check this book. And thank goodness I did. Because I had things like I had a character greeting another character. And she was a female character greeting an older male. And she says to him, Kanjan. And Kanjan is hello in Shona. Like it's kind of in Australia. It would be g'day or watcha or how's it, you know, or whatever. And she said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. She says she has to say Mangwanani Baba, which is good morning, father, in the formal tone, you know. And Mm -hmm. and with a term of respect, because it just jarred her to the core. And she says, you can't do that. And here am I, like, waltzing around Zimbabwe saying, Kanjan, to everybody I meet. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) you've got got a a little bit of knowledge. The other thing, too, of course, Jane, is a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. So, again, it's like Mm -hmm. like research and researching place. I do this for all my research. I, I, I don't even, like, really do a lot of research when I'm writing. If, if I don't know something like a piece of language or even a technical thing like how to stitch up a wound or fly a helicopter or something, I just leave it blank and just put check and in my manuscript. And then I research retrospectively. So after I've done the first draft, I'll go and find a, a person. And I've had about six people read my forthcoming book, a book called Vendetta, which is set partially in the 1980s in South Africa when the country during the apartheid era was engaged in a war in Angola. And I've had quite a few people read this book for accuracy and sensitivity because the best way to research is talk to people. I I am 100% convinced of that after 20 years, that that is the best and most accurate way is to find a subject matter expert or someone from that cultural community to read and check your work if they'll do that. I find people are very generous and it's probably more work than reading lots of books and researching online, but the human element is just crucial for me on that sensitivity side of things. And obviously you love the research process too. I mean, that obviously comes through in what you're saying. I also love the research process. So I think research and respect, respect for all of these different cultures, of course, Africa, particularly every single African country has so many different groups as well. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I can imagine this can, I mean, you can't possibly know all these things. Whoever you are, you cannot know everything. So yeah, respect and um, research. I think that those are really good. Beautiful way to put it. Yeah, I must say that's a really, really good way to put it. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. Yeah. And I certainly I encourage as you do as well. We encourage people to write about things outside of their own culture and experience, because Mm. like, why would we be fiction writers otherwise? It would be so boring. (laughs) 
<laughs> but yes, I think that those are some ways to avoid trouble. But I also wanted to ask you, you've mentioned the wildlife and you've said that your books include social issues, politics, the environment, and many authors want to bring attention to causes they care about. But equally, these things can turn into like a, a lecture and it's like, oh Ooh. gosh, not another book bashing on about the environment when I just wanted a thriller. So how do you balance that between writing like a story and then advocating for things that you want to bring attention to? Yeah, look, that's a really, really good question. And I think there was something I read, it might have been in Stephen King's book, that the story is king. You know, I don't know whether it was a play on words, but you've <laughs> got to keep the readers turning the pages, you know, whatever, whether it comes to describing a location, you don't, you're it so, or history or having to give some historical background. If you get too bogged down, the reader's going to stop turning the pages, right? And, mm. and the same thing goes for causes as well. I am passionate about those things that I mentioned about wildlife and some socioeconomic causes and politics, but I am acutely aware that within my readership, there are people on the polar opposite sides of these issues. Mm. Uh, I don't want to alienate anybody for commercial reasons, but I want to I want to kind of be honest. And uh, although I worked, as I said, I, I did work as a journalist for a few years. I don't think there's an awful lot from having worked as a journo that really helps you to write fiction. But I would say the two exceptions to that are a dialogue, because you kind of get taught and used to putting words in people's mouths as a journalist. You get used to capturing spoken speech in a written format. But the other thing is balance. And when I present an issue, um, say rhino poaching, which is an issue that comes up in a few of my books, rhinos are killed for their horns. And it's a big problem here in South Africa because this is unfortunately where the, the last, most of the world's rhinos live here. So this is kind of ground zero. And the, there is a an ongoing debate in rhino conservation about whether or not to legalise the train in rhino horn. I have my personal views. I'm actually opposed to it, but many of my friends are, are vehemently in favour of it. And so when it comes to an issue like that, I try to weave in both sides of the debate, in, in again, in a respectful manner, as you say. So I will have a character who is kind of uh, pro-trade, pro-legalisation of the trade in rhino horn, and I'll have one who's stridently against. And I'm sure that the... I hope at least that the pro-trade people look at that character and feel more sympathy for them than they do for the other one. And the same thing comes with politics as well, too, because, like I said, politics is a life and death business over here in some mm, countries. For sure. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I'm not kind of afraid of stating things is, but I try to approach it as I would if I was a journo, objectively, with balance, and respectfully. So you don't go into a diatribe uh, about why this particular policy or politician is, is bad, but you try and show the effects that their policies have had on an individual person. Like Stephen King says, zoom in. So if you see people obviously poorly dressed, they're starving, they're perhaps begging for food, and you see a politician driving past in a brand new Mercedes Benz, you don't have to be told there's something wrong with that scene. You show, don't tell. And people reading that will nod their heads and say, yep, that's accurate. That's pretty well how it is in some of the countries that uh, that I write about. So you fall back on the good old show, don't tell. My editor and publisher are very good at putting little notes in the side of the margin saying, stop downloading, Tony. You're downloading information here. <laughs> That's a problem when you love research, right? I want to tell you everything. <laughs> yeah, it's the classic trap, isn't it? And we've all fallen for it. Oh, and, would I? Uh, but then I would say as a reader, like I grew up with Wilbur Smith as well and Ryder Haggard, and I actually love that. And I'm sure you've heard me talk about, oh, I went to school in Malawi. And so sort of reading about Africa, and that's how I came to know of your books and connecting with you is quite thrilling for me because I've seen your books for years. So that's quite <laughs> kind of cool, you know, and, and that's because of the book reading books set in Africa that I've done since I was a, a child. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think if I look at, if you look at someone like Wilbur, um, he's unfortunately passed away, but uh, when the books of his that I like the most were those early ones set in the seventies and eighties, when he was writing a lot about contemporary Africa, contemporary Southern Africa and the issues that were, were big at the time. And I think that's what strikes a chord with people 
uh, as well, because it's a funny continent, as you'd be mm. acutely aware. There's lots of problems here. There's crime and corruption and political mismanagement and poverty and health issues tend to be exponentially worse here. But the, the interesting thing about this continent, it comes back to the people, um, is that I think if there's one thing that struck me that's greater than the scale of problems that people face, and you would have no doubt seen this yourself, it is, it's the ability of good people more often than not at the village level or the grassroots level or the volunteer level or the park ranger level to just come together and do the most extraordinary things, to go out of their way, to get their children an education, to sacrifice so much so that the next generation will be better off. Or in the case of, of rangers in the anti-poaching area, to literally put their lives on the line to protect wildlife. And that's the sort of thing that I like to capture because that's what kind of inspires me. And, it, and that's what I used to like reading about in some of those other African books as well too, that, that kind of that raw effort at the grassroots level of people to sort of do the right thing. The other thing, I mean, you're talking there a lot about the historical aspects of of Africa and South Africa, but I mean, things are obviously very different now as well. And that has one of the biggest mobile economies, that leapfrog idea of a tech where everyone's using mobile payments and mobile, mm. not even banking, just mobile apps for, for money. And we were reading this article the other day about blood delivery by drone, like the drone deliveries into places in Africa. Yeah. It's really exciting. And we can't do that here because different regulations and just I guess overcrowding and things like that and of course Nigeria is one of the fastest growing economies in the world and so yep. I, I feel like another issue if people are thinking and like you say if they haven't visited places um, how do we avoid the stereotypes because I feel like books written about like 1980 South Africa for example that's just not the reality of what South Africa is now and any of these countries have just changed so much and I'm sure there are still some people living in some areas where it hasn't changed but how can people avoid the stereotypes in that way? Yeah, well, I think it's when it comes to travel, like if you're lucky enough to to say, I'm going to go on a holiday to South Africa to research as well. One of the problems is you might end up cocooned. You might end up stuck on a luxury private game reserve or something like that, and you won't see what's going on outside in the big wide world. And I'm not advocating that people, you know, go out to to areas where they might not feel safe or comfortable, but it does go to talking to people. And that's something that I keep coming back to as well, that my best source of research is, is human beings, is talking to people. Uh, to give you an example about not falling into stereotypes as well too, is uh, during lockdown, I wrote a book called Blood Trail. And Blood Trail is like a couple of my other books about rhino poaching, but it's about a particular aspect of that struggle is that uh, poachers and sometimes rangers will enlist the help of traditional healers, uh, Isangoma, uh, to give them talismans or medicine or potions, if you like, that, that they believe will increase their chances of surviving in the bush, whether that is they're a ranger or whether they're a poacher. They will buy a potion that will make them invisible or will turn them into an animal to avoid detection or to avoid being shot. And these are serious, serious beliefs. Now, the the many people will just dismiss this out of hand. To those sort of people that say, well, that's a load of nonsense, I'd say, have you never had a St. Christopher medal in your life? Have you never have you never prayed? And there's that wonderful saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. People do turn to religion and other belief systems in the context of high risk, high reward environments. And that can be a war zone or it could be going out in the bush trying to kill a rhino and being a raid against armed rangers. So the way I got around that and the way I did my research for that book was to have some pretty in-depth conversations with some friends of mine about their belief systems. And in the course of doing that, I was able to get so much rich information about their current attitudes to politics and how the country was going just by conversations. And I think one of the great things about being a writer and and it sort of is the same as being a journalist, is that you kind of have a license to ask the most in-depth and personal questions of people. And that's the best way to avoid stereotypes because you're getting the information straight from the person's mouth and from the heart. And I was able to learn so much more about some of my friends uh, by asking them, hey, 
do you believe in traditional medicine and would you use it yourself and why? And again, I found so many parallels with like Western culture as well and our belief systems and superstitions and things like that. So that's how I try and avoid it. You know, it's that human contact, that human element. Fantastic. Well, there's so much we could talk about, but we're out of time. So tell people where they can find you and your books online. Uh, I've got my good old website, which is www.tonypark.net. I do sell wide, as we say, everywhere outside South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. So yeah, I'm on online on print, audio and ebook everywhere. Though. So tonypark.net is my, my home base. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Tony. That was great. Thank you so much, Joanne. I really appreciate it. And can I just say again how much I enjoy your podcast? And I I think we talk a lot about social media. I I love through social media that I have a direct conduit to my readers and we can have a genuine conversation with each other. And podcasts such as yours and the others I've learned through your podcast are so great because now as authors, we can have that same level of communication with each other and learn from each other. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. So I hope you found this episode useful in terms of writing setting and that you found it interesting to hear about how Tony has navigated changes in the publishing industry over the last 20 years. So next week, I'm talking about crafting your novel's key moments with John Matthew Fox. So another craft episode coming up next week. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>